Could LaVisca Chenault be an unexpected breakout performer for the Panthers in 2023? I'll answer that question and many more on this week's edition of the Weekly Friday Mailbag right here on Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, your team every day. That's our motto here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter, at Julian Council, where on Fridays, like today, I answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions either at me or DM me over on Twitter at Julian Council to get those questions into me now. And we're back again for another edition of the weekly Friday mailbag as the Carolina Panthers have had two practices in their 2023 training camp down there in Spartanburg, South Carolina, on the campus of Wofford College ahead of the 2023 NFL season. And a lot of us are very happy football's back, even though it's kind of not really back because they haven't played any games that actually matter. But it's better than the alternative of really there being nothing going on. So happy to have training camp back and happy um, that we're just another step closer to this season finally being here. So a lot of questions on this week's episode. I know that the Twitter has been weird recently. So I know someone last week had told me that they couldn't DM me. Uh, my DM should be open um, if you're having issues doing that. Uh, just at me. So at me or DM me, not quite sure what the hell Elon Musk is doing other than wrecking entire website. Uh, but starting off with Kendrick this week, he says, we all know what position groups appear less than stellar. He says wide receiver pass rush. Is it possible that the coaching staff values players fulfilling roles and skill sets rather than having a dude at high dollar skill position? Coach Reich as an OC on a Super Bowl winning Eagles didn't have a pass catcher with more than 900 yards. Coach Avero didn't have a player with over seven sacks to the Broncos last year. Well, I also mentioned the Broncos were a god awful football team last year. Now the defense was, of course, good. It was the offense and Russell Wilson falling short. So, yes, only seven sacks. Um, and they traded Bradley Chubb in the process. And he's someone who you would expect to be able to get double-digit sacks, especially the kind of money that the Miami Dolphins are now paying him. Um, did he ever really live up to that hype in Denver? Yes and no. Uh, but either way, I, I can understand why last season, just looking at what they had on the roster and knowing that they traded Chubb away, why they would have fallen short of that benchmark. And that Eagles team, all around was just a fantastic football team. And that was Nelson Aguilar was a wide receiver, I believe, that year, um, who had a pretty good season. Get Zach Ertz as a receiver at a tight end position. It was just a damn good football team. Well, and you saw it because they won the Super Bowl. So they had dudes in a lot of spots, though. They might not have had like that dude at wide receiver and maybe some other positions, but I'm pretty sure any coaching staff would rather have a dude than having players fulfill roles in certain skill sets. Like you would rather have a Brian Burns than have a Marquise Haynes who's filling a role on the other side of the ball just out of necessity and the lack of ever better options currently here on the roster. I think the Panthers would rather have a dude like Jamar Chase than having DJ Chark, but the situation's don't allow for that to happen right now. So, yeah, I think every coach would rather have a dude than just a guy. So I kind of under, I understand what you're saying. You're asking more so as, okay, like, like, are they content with what they have? I don't know if they're ever content. And maybe I'm misrepresenting what you're asking, but that's kind of how I'm interpreting it. Uh, I don't know that necessarily that they're content. Now, Scott Fitter did say the other day that their nature is to be aggressive. Uh, you can question whether they've actually – been aggressive this offseason. We can also see they've been aggressive to a fault in past years, trading for CJ Henderson, um, going out there and getting Sam Darnold, Baker Mayfield. Like those things didn't work out for them in the past. So it might actually make more sense for the Panthers to have not spent a ton of money on players like Adam Thielen and DJ Chark. And they didn't really spend that much on Hayden Hurst either. And even Miles Sanders in a running back market where you don't even have to pay running backs anymore to find a good one. They paid him what is not that much money. But looking at the running back position, what everyone else got seems like it's a lot of money. But either way, it's not like they broke the bank on anyone. And they did find a lot of players that may not be 
dudes, but are good enough to get the job done. They have NFL starting caliber players in a lot of positions, which is important. Now, is there great depth behind them? I would say no, um, for the most part, especially when you look at if something happens to Brian Burns, they're effed. Uh, if something happens to Jay-Z Horn, they're also screwed there at a cornerback. Um, if something happens, I mean, Price, I mean, Dalton, I guess, is fine. So I guess they're probably deeper at quarterbacks because they have Andy Dalton with all those years of experience than they are in some of the other positions. Like safety, I think they're fairly deep there. Linebacker, not super deep either. Uh, even new uh, Camus can come step up for them and start if they need him to. Um, so I guess that's better depth than you look at some certain positions, but they don't have a lot of depth, but I do feel like as far as like their first 22, I think it's solid, but we know the game of football is going to yield some injuries and that the Panthers are going to have to call upon some of these guys to step up. And we've seen in the past that that has not really happened, but I do think they've done overall a good job of rebuilding the wide receiver core. I think that they've done a good job of what they brought in into the secondary and what Von Bell is going to allow Jeremy Chin to do and how that's probably going to elevate the defense and give them more op op options this upcoming season. So I do think that the staff has done a good job in filling roles and finding players who fit their skill sets. Um, when, when you look at the market at wide receiver, there wasn't really a dude out there in that, especially at pass rusher as well. There wasn't really like a dude out there. Leonard Floyd would have made sense. Um, but if he was more comfortable on the Buffalo and if that was something the Panthers could make happen, you know, they went out there at least drafted someone prior to even, trying to get Leonard Floyd if they even tried to get him uh, at all. So I feel like they've done a decent job of fulfilling some of those roles and skill sets, fulfilling some of the holes that are on the roster. Like everything that I asked for them to do this offseason, they've done. And it's one of those things where it's not just going to happen in one offseason. It's going to take some time. And Scott Fitter said that, and Frank Reich certainly said it with Bryce Young and his development and then the kind of the, um, the you know, the, the, be, the rebuild and the process they're going to use there. It takes time. So overall, what we saw this offseason uh, feels fairly successful. But we'll have to see what they do this upcoming year and whether that will actually have been the case. Um, now with Alex, who says it's no secret that DJ Chark has struggled with injuries in the last couple of years. Do you think Demir Bird was brought in as a speed receiver insurance in case he goes down? If Chark makes it through camp healthy, is Bird more likely to be cut? Um, I think Bird already is right there on the roster fringe. Uh, I was looking at because I'm recording this actually Thursday before practice, I was looking at the, uh, the socials and it looked like you had guys like Shai Smith um, and Raheem Blackshear out there returning kicks. I don't look at Bird as being one of those guys, particularly because he really hasn't done it that much in the NFL. But I do believe that this coaching staff did not just bring him in here. A player who was fairly productive in Atlanta has been productive throughout his career and, and the roles that he's played. He's been a fine player. He's not someone that you're expecting to go out there and be like your number two, but as like a fourth option, he can be fine for you in Carolina. And they're going to utilize guys in different ways at wide receiver. Like we're expecting Thielen to be in the slot. We're expecting Chark to be on the outside. I don't look at Demir Bird as an outside wide receiver. So I don't really see how he would be um, like a deep ball threat replacement like DJ Chark is expected to be here in Carolina, but he is someone that you can, you know, do some jet sweeps with. You can put him in motion and hit him in the slot if, if you need to. Like, if anything, you might be able to come in and maybe be what some of the replacement if Adam Thielen goes down, just thinking that they're likely closer to each other as far as what the Panthers are going to ask out of Thielen and what they would ask out of Bird if he makes the roster. So I don't think Shark staying healthy really has any sort of impact on whether Demir Bird makes the roster. I think Bird is mainly competing with Shai Smith for that wide receiver position, showing that he's a more overall better receiver than him and trying to probably be that backup to Adam Thielen. Because again, going into it, Thielen, pretty safe there, I would I would guess. <laughs> Thielen's on the roster, Chark can be on the roster, uh, Mingo's on the roster. Then I would think that Marshall would be on the roster as well. Him and uh, Jonathan Mingo competing for that X wide receiver slot. Then Chenault, who they had lined up in the backfield on opening day of training camp on Wednesday, they're going to utilize him in far greater ways than the Panthers did last year. So he'll be on the roster. And then it just kind of comes down to how many other guys they want to add. Do they want to have a six guy or they go with five? I think they would add a six. And it comes down to kind of Chark and Shy and whether, you know, one of those guys more in, in particular, Shy Smith can differentiate aid himself um, in special teams, be able to make the roster that way. By the way, it's going to be Gamecock and Gamecock crime there um, in the upstate of South Carolina. All right, there's two questions there. Going to come back, answer more of your questions, especially one about LaVishka Chenault, where they can break out and what the edge rusher situation looks like uh, here in Carolina this upcoming season. That coming up here in just a moment on Locked On Panthers. 
Our partners at eBay Motors have teamed up with Locked On Fantasy Football host Vinny Iyer to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long. Whether you're prepping for a draft or scouting the waiver wire, every week we're going to provide you players that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. So let's wrap prep underway for the upcoming season. Let's see who Vinny has picked out for us on this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. When the top tier quarterbacks is off the board in fantasy football drafts in 2023, there's another line of luxury passers who are guaranteed to fit your starting lineups every week. Driving a sleeker Jaguars offense that now features wide receiver Calvin Ridley, Trevor Lawrence has top five scoring upside as a QB1. Expect Lawrence to keep living up to his immense arm and athletic talent and cruise the production that builds off his hot fitness to last season. Vinny Iyer from Locked On Fantasy Football is going to help you win your fantasy championship. And eBay Motors knows a championship team is all about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. With eBay guaranteed fit over 122 million parts and accessories for your vehicle right at your fingertips, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Air filters, brakes, batteries, taillights, alternators, shocks, struts, you name it eBay Motors has it. They'll make sure it's the right fit for your car because eBay Guaranteed Fit helps you understand exactly what part you need for the vehicle the first time. So go forth, switch gears, crank the AC, and say goodbye to sweating if your ride needs a little fixing up because now you know you'll always be set up for success from the get-go. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, everything your vehicle is calling for is just a click away. For the parts and accessories that, you're, that fit your vehicle, just look for the green check, get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices at ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Let's get back into it. The weekly Friday mailbag here on Locked On Panthers. Again, either at me or DM me over on Twitter at Julian Council. And one thing I meant to mention at the top of the show, uh, thinking about it, going into the season, maybe switching things up once we actually get into the regular season, maybe doing the mailbag on Wednesdays, which would mean I would be recording on Tuesday. And I was thinking about doing it live on Tuesday evenings um, around like 7 or 8 o'clock. So y'all tweet at me, send me some feedback on whether you would like to do kind of a live mailbag on Tuesday evenings that will air on Wednesday in your podcast stream. And then on Fridays, kind of focus more on the last things I got to say heading into the game. So like Mondays, reacting to what happened on Sunday. Um, Tuesday, reacting to uh, the press conference that Frank Reich has and still looking back on Sunday. Then on Tuesday evening, which will be Wednesday's show, doing a live mailbag over on YouTube. And then over on, and you can still send questions in, by the way. You can still send questions in the traditional way, but then I can look at the chat and maybe get into some people's questions there as well, make it a little bit more interactive, and it'd be cool to do that live. And then Thursday would be our crossover Thursdays with the other uh, lockdown hosts for the opposing team. Then Fridays, kind of last thoughts heading into the weekend. So if you all think like a live on Tuesday nights, airing on a Wednesday on the podcast feed, mailbag is good in your eyes, in your mind heading into the year, let me know. Cause that's something I've been thinking about trying to switch things up and um, I think get a little bit more interactive and get more uh, people um, into it. Cause I know with YouTube, I don't read the comments. So I'm sure people probably put in mailbag questions. I, again, I've never answered them. So I think that'd be a good way to interact with both the YouTube audience and also the people who just go ahead and traditionally send me in uh, their questions either by adding me or DM me over on Twitter at Julian council, but back to the mailbag and um, to the order of business that we have today. You got Eric, who asked with Jero Barrow having a history of playing a three-man front and using the best rusher as a decoy, do you think Burns' production will go down in terms of sacks? Also, who would benefit the most if this tactic is used? I have a hard time believing that um, they're going to want to utilize Brian Burns as a decoy, and I would have to read up more on kind of how guys in the past, I really last year, have been utilized in his defense. That's the only year he's been a defensive coordinator. In the NFL, I had to go back and look more at the Broncos and see how they would have used Chubb before they traded him. And then whoever would have replaced Chubb as that primary uh, edge rusher last season for the Broncos. Isn't Randy Gregory like a Bronco now or something like that? I would have to go back and look at that to understand um, what went down. So I really can't speak to it. I just don't see how you would have a player who had 12 and a half sacks last year, who's been a a pro bowler in back to back season and is your only edge rushing threat, like high level edge rushing threat. And you're about to pay him like probably 120 million plus. I don't understand why you would use him as a decoy when the other options are Marquise Haynes, DJ Johnson, Amari Barno, 
Etor Grosbatos. Like, I don't understand that tactic at all. Like, that would seem kind of foolish to me, but he knows way more about football than I will ever know. So, I, I don't know. It doesn't I just know that you, when you have your good players, you typically want to put your players in a position to succeed. And so, yes, there's going to be times where Burns, instead of rushing when the team thinks he's going to do that, he's going to be able to drop back in coverage. And Brian talked about that on Wednesday when speaking to the media, that he's going to be able to show off his football IQ this year, where he's going to be able to disguise what he's going to do, and that he's going to be able to have, be, have more freedom. So it won't be every situation where it's like, oh, hey, it's a pass rushing situation. Burns is obviously going to rush. He might drop back in coverage and try and confuse the quarterback and the offenses. So that's just part of the game there. But in like those real high leverage situations, I do think that they're going to want to have Brian Burns on uh, seek and destroy mode and go out there and get the quarterback. So I don't know if his production will go down. It's truly hard to say. I think if anything, it's going to stay steady or maybe go up. Like if it goes down a sack or two, like that's still double digit sacks. Now, it depends on what everyone else outside of him does and how the whole team overall edge rushing or pass rushing um, numbers look like. I don't think they're going to go down. And I don't think that they're going to be um, in those situations a lot of times asking Brian Burns to play decoy. But yes, the scheme is going to call for him sometimes to the drop instead of going out there and rushing. Now, who would benefit the most? There's already talk from Scott Fitter, and I'm sure we'll hear. May, I don't, I doubt that. It, it, after the press conference earlier, in the spring from Avero, uh, I just don't feel like he's ever going to tell us anything. Uh, he will meet with the media every Thursday, so we'll find out whether that's a, a useless uh, venture each week or not. But early returns it was not very open. Um, as far as someone who I think who could benefit, it would be Frankie Louvu. Lou Scott Fitter, the Panthers general manager, said on Tuesday morning, which or Tuesday afternoon, uh, would still get an opportunity to be an edge rusher. He would not just be playing solely inside at linebacker, that he'll still get those opportunities. And that would be wise. He had seven sacks last year in his first year as a full-time starter in the NFL. We saw what he was able to do, playing off the ball as well. And for Luvu, him getting a chance to also be versatile where he can play inside and can play outside and pass rush and drop back in coverage is only going to help him get paid a ton of money this upcoming spring. Remember, he's a free agent come March. So that's one of those things where I think that he's somebody I think could really benefit if the Panthers do ask Burns to kind of drop back in coverage and they can send him, and he's shown that he can be productive in the past. Um, over to Gus now. He says the way Scott Fitter has talked about um, LaVishka Chenault, they seem to be very high on him, and the only knock has really been not having a full route tree. If he can develop even a couple downfield routes, what's the ceiling on him? I don't know if they're going to ask him to do that. That's the thing. Like, okay, So you have a couple of receivers here, and that's one of the things about the receiving core when I look at it. You have guys who have the potential to be pretty good for you. Like Shark's been a pro bowler. Obviously, Thielen's been a fantastic player throughout his career. He's just getting older. And I'm sitting here, I'm 30, he's 33. I feel gross saying that, but he's got a lot of wear and tear on those bones, man, and on that body. So I, I get it. Football years, he's old. He's still a very young man in great physical shape. Um, but of course it catches up to you. But I think, I mean, Thielen, I still feel like he's gonna be good. But like you look at the other guys outside of Thielen, I don't feel like there's like a complete wide receiver. Like I, I still believe that Adam Thielen, well, like route running and all that still is just might not have the speed and might not be the kind of player that he was. Like he certainly can't be the kind of player he was, you know, six years ago when he was having a thousand yard receiving seasons. Um, but shark, they want to build the, the route tree for Mingo. They probably need to build his route tree. And work with him. Big task there for Sean Jefferson. Uh, Terrace Marshall, they probably need to do the same thing. Like, you have a lot of guys, and LaVishka Chenault's one of them as well. You got a lot of guys here that the Panthers are really trying to coach up and having to coach up, which, hey, that's the job of the team. And obviously the players on the in the offseason have to work on their craft. But it's also the, the job of the wide receiver coach to get the most out of them and to have these dudes, you know, playing at the highest level possible. So what is the ceiling for LaVishka Chenault? I don't know if they're going to have him downfield routes. Um, I just, I don't feel like that's the kind of game he has. I feel like he's a guy who's going to be more like the short to intermediate where they can use him in the backfield and they can use him on screens. Like they did last year, but they also can you know, put him on some slants, got a pretty big body. I feel like that's what they could use him for. And I really do feel like they would want to have Marshall or Mingo or really, you know, um, DJ Chark as more downfield guys, but the ceiling, he's a guy who could maybe have four or 500 yards with those combined touches receiving 
and rushing. Like, I feel like that's just looking at the options that the Panthers have. Because that's I, that's why I said last week, I think, why I didn't feel like they would have a thousand yard receiver. Because I think that Sharks going to get his touches, Thielen's going to get his touches, Hurst's going to get his touches. I think Miles will get some touches. Um, I think that Lavishka will get some touches, touches, Terrace, all the Domingo. There's a lot to go around here offensively. So I, I don't know if anyone's going to have like big time numbers, but I think if you can have like 500 all purpose yards this year, maybe six, that, that, that would be like the ceiling on LaVishka Chanel, just considering the opportunities are there and just kind of uh, what his role would be this upcoming season in Carolina. All right, uh, I'm going to answer a couple more questions here on the other side. Talk about the run game and what the Panthers are going to do if they don't have a short yardage back and which rookie could be next in line to grab a starting position now that Bryce Young is QB1. All that and more coming up here on Locked On Panthers. All right, two more questions here on this edition of the Weekly Friday Mailbag. Again, either at me or DM me over on Twitter, at Julian Council. Send me some feedback on what I mentioned earlier uh, here on the show on whether uh, – I should go live on Tuesday evenings and do a live mailbag there. And then, of course, put that in the podcast feed on Wednesday. Let me know if that's what you all want to see once the season really gets going. And then we can focus on Fridays uh, just on the game ahead and final thoughts I have and that you may have as well. Um, now over to Van from San Antonio. Uh, hey, Van. He said, I like what we have as far as the pieces to the run game. What run scheme and blocking scheme does it look like we're going to go with? Also, what the hell are we going to do in the run game in short yardage? Not a whole lot of confidence in Spencer Brown. Now, I do not pretend to be one of those um, all 22 or like scheme football nerds that you have out there, like Amina Kimes, so smart, knows the game so well. I don't pretend to be like one of those people that like is breaking down, like grinding the tape. Like I look at the narratives, watch the games, I read as much as I can. I talk to people who know it better than I do. Like that's just, I know my lane. I know my strengths, I know my weaknesses and all that kind of stuff. I do not pretend to do that. But I did Google this for you. And I went back, looked at some articles, kind of understand more of what um, Frank Reich does offensively. And you can also go with the Rams at offensively and incorporate that. What they primarily do is they run, they do a zone run game. But according to this red article I read, Frank Reich has shown the adaptability and inventiveness in integrating more and more gap schemes um, like power, trap, and pin and pull runs. So that's something to look out for. Also, Zach Hicks of Locked On Colts. He also writes for the Colts Sports Illustrated site that covers their team, of course. Um, he had a really good article a year ago on some of the run schemes that Frank Reich uses. I encourage you to just Google Frank Reich run schemes and even put Zach Hicks name out there and you'll be able to find that article. So that's something that I think visually will be a lot easier for you. Cause if it would be different, if that was, you know, my forte and I kind of had like a, a whiteboard I, or a chalk, I don't know, a whiteboard behind me and I, or I could put up this, the images and show you, you know, what it looks like, but he does a really good breakdown on what it looks like a little bit of chalk talk there um, in that article. So I would tell you to Google Frank Reich run schemes, put in Zach Hicks name as well, and you'll be able to find that and read that article. That will give you even more insight to uh, what he does. And maybe I'll have Zach Hicks on at some point uh, this preseason if we can find some time that makes sense to go over some of that stuff. But a really good breakdown from him. And hey, if I can't really answer to answer it for you um, and wisely or intelligently, then I will just point you in a way uh, or a direction where you can find it. So there you go, Van in San Antonio. Thank you for your question. Um, anonymous, because this guy's like actual like name on Twitter was something uh, random. Uh, he's like a Nevada Wolfpack fan. So, hey, go pack like the one in Reno, not the one in Raleigh. He asks, which rookie can you see grabbing a starting position first after Bryce Young wins the QB1 position? Of course, we know Bryce Young won the QB1 position back on March 10th when the Panthers traded up to number one. Um, he sort of already officially had won it back uh, during OTAs, right before mandatory minicamp when he was running with the ones. And then on Wednesday, Frank Reich came out and just said it after asked by Will Kunkel that, hey, is he QB1? He said, yes, he's QB1. In a discussion, no sort of competition, no nonsense. Bryce Young is the quarterback here in Carolina, something that we have known for a very, very long time was going to be the case. But there's only a couple other rookies, I think, that could even have an opportunity of being the next guy to take a starting job. Look at the ones that were drafted. Um, okay, like Jamie Robinson, just don't see the opportunity there for him, even though I think he can get on the field this year. Um, when you look at Chandler Zabala, 
he would be the one I would say, yeah, he would have a great chance to get a starting job because he has a connection with Vicky Aquanu. The Panthers have talked a lot about their relationship. He's a solid player. The only problem there, he's on pup. And as long as he's on the physically unable to perform list, which is, he's going to be out for a couple of weeks without a hamstring, uh, I don't see how he's going to come in and take Brady Christensen's job. And we saw last year just how players can be impacted by injuries in the preseason and training camp. Bradley Bozeman hurts his ankle. He's competing there at center with Pat Elfline and ends up as the backup to go into the year because Elfline was healthy. Now, Elfline did a fine job, but once we saw Elfline go down with that injury, Bradley goes and came in and the Panthers run game was much better, even though that was an emphasis once he came in, but he was a better player. And now he's here long-term in Carolina. Whereas I think Elfline is still out on the street looking for a job, unfortunately for his case. So you can see how that can impact a player in making of the roster, but also just, you know, being able to win that, that job. So I don't think Zavala is in that category right now, unfortunately, because of the injury, maybe we'll see, but it doesn't look like he's gonna be able to um, usurp the throne there at left guard from Brady Christensen, this year, at least coming out of camp, uh, DJ Johnson could have a chance. He could, um, more project kind of diet guy, but he's, they picked him the third round. And when you get picked in the third round, they're expecting you to play, especially at a position of need there at edge rusher. And we'll see if the Panthers bring in a veteran, what they do when the roster cutdowns come. And if there's other guys out there on the waiver wire, that they think they can help them, but he's going to get some reps this year. I don't know if he's going to be a starter. I would say that Marquise Haynes is going to be the starter. Um, but something would happen to Haynes, or if he somehow outperforms him, then that might be your starter. Uh, the guy, though, I think has the best chance, and I would have said like Zavala would have been like right there, kind of on par with him. But the guy who has the best chance is Jonathan Mingo. Uh, Second-round pick, 39th overall, competing there at X-wide receiver with Terrace Marshall. Haven't heard really a lot um, from the coaching staff on Terrace Marshall so far. Um, and then Mingo, this is the guy that they picked. Scott Fitter. Matt Rule, I don't know who had the greater influence there. They took Terrace Marshall. This coaching staff took Jonathan Mingo. And Reich has been speaking his praises. Scott Fitter has spoken his praises, saying he's going to play a big role for the Panthers. He's going to play, uh, I don't know if it's a big role, but he's going to play a role. And they don't know how soon that's going to be. But there is someone who's going to grab a starting position right after Bryce has already taken QB1 position, which was always going to be his. Uh, the clear answer in my mind is Jonathan Mingo. Like that's the guy to look out for to come out and potentially be your starter. Cause you're looking at it, steel and shark. And who's going to be, who's going to be that third guy would not be surprised at all. And at this point, it could even be expected just based off of the way that the general manager and the head coach have talked about him. If, and maybe even when Jonathan Mingo is your opening day starter there at X wide receiver. And as your number three wide receiver heading into 2023 on the road against Atlanta. All right, that's going to wrap up this edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, hosted by yours, Julie, Julian Council. Again, y'all make sure to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter at Julian Council, where next Friday I'll be back again to answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions either at me or DM me to get those questions into me now. And also let me know what y'all think about potentially me going live on YouTube around 7 or 8 o'clock on Tuesday evenings once the season gets underway. And on Wednesday, then releasing that to the podcast streams as far as doing a live mailbag where I can allow the chat over on YouTube to uh, get their comments in, but also can take questions traditionally. So let me know what you will think about that. Want to try and mix some things up here and maybe have Fridays be more dedicated to just the game that's going on Sunday. And my final thoughts, maybe even some of y'all's final thoughts heading into all of it. All right, that's going to be it. So as always, um, what do I say? In the meantime, be safe, be happy, be whole. As always, keep pounding, and I'll talk to y'all on Monday.